Okay, good. Uh, so I'm talking about radiation detectors. I want to finish up with silicon radiation detectors. Those are the newer ones, and I uh, wanted to talk about that because I've got one that I'm working on. First off, um, some of you know Mike Moody from Missouri passed away a couple months ago. He hosted GPSL in 2015, so I'm going to make my presentation in, in his memory. We have launched together several times and reached 124,000 feet on one of the balloons. It was pretty cool. <clears throat> so this is a list of kind of the, what I put together of the types of radiation detectors that have been used in the past. And this all goes back to over 100 years ago, about 125 year history right here of different types of radiation detectors. Uh, some of you have, have experimented with some of these. Uh, the Geiger Muller tube, part of the Geiger counter is, is the one that uh, probably most of us have ever launched into near space before. <clears throat> But it all starts back with scintillators and photographic film uh, back to 1895. Lincoln and Baccarel uh, discovered x-rays and radiation respectively. And initially it started with a, a screen of um, zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide is a scintillator. When the alpha particles strike it, <clears throat> give the molecule enough energy to produce a flash of light. Uh, the, other, the other one, that was uh, what uh, Rankin was using. A back, uh, back row who discovered radiation uh, actually had a uranium ore on, or on film. And film was only several decades old at that point. You know, photography is several decades old at that point. Uh, he could actually take a piece of, uh, discovered that he could take photographic film, put it in paper so that light couldn't, wouldn't be exposed to light or keep it in the dark put this uh, mineral on top of it and it would actually expose the film. I've tried to launch photographic film into near space to look for the effects. So I got dental x-ray film from a dentist, launched it up back in 96 or 97, 1996, 1997, nothing happened. I'd be curious to know if anybody else has had better success than, uh, than I have with photographic film. But the, uh, this led to a discovery of radioactivity atoms or uranium specifically that would pay the first x-ray images and the two images I have here the top one is the hand of the wife of Rankin and you can see her wedding ring on her hand the bottom image is a spintharoscope and I hope I pronounced that correctly this is a lens that's focused on a screen of zinc sulfide and you have a radioactive material against that screen and you can actually see the sparks spinthari um, if I, again, pronounce that correctly, uh, if you speak Greek, please understand. Uh, but that means spark. So it's a spark scope. I had read recently that in the late 40s and early 50s, you could get a trick cereal, not tricks, um, a, a breakfast cereal. It had the Lone Ranger ring, it had the silver bullet that was actually a spintharoscope. So I don't know how you figure radiation and the Lone Ranger, but they managed to put them together in this one. Uh, ring that you could buy with your with your breakfast cereal. Paul, we did have one comment from Kendra okay. saying she had a student who did the same thing, flying dental x-ray film and did not get any hit, hits when processed. Okay, yeah, so I was expecting to see it. I left one on the ground, one into near space, and the films were, they were no different. So they developed them at the, at the office and they were identical, so I was really surprised. I really thought that dental x-ray film was more sensitive than that. Uh, one reason being that I like to think that they're not using excessive radiation to see the cavities in my teeth, but there you have it. Uh, next was the electroscope. And some of you have probably played with the electroscopes. I've made some in electrostatics classes. Back to 18, 1787 by a British, Abraham Bennett. This consists of two gold leaves and they fold it over a piece of wire. And, when you, and what this was used originally for was to detect electrostatic fields. When you uh, put a charge on the electroscope, the, field, the leaves have the same charge. The charges will repel each other and the leaves will split apart. Uh, they discharge over time and the leaves will come back together again. Uh, what they found out is that one source of that uh, leakage was due to cosmic rays that if you brought a radioactive substance near the electroscope, leaves would discharge more quickly than if you didn't. 
And uh, this led to the discovery of cosmic rays because we had uh, there was balloon flights manned or crewed balloon flights back in 1912, bring up electroscopes. And the discovery was that the electroscopes discharged more quickly the higher the altitude. And this led to the discovery of cosmic rays. The source of radiation was not the Earth, but was actually coming down from space. Um, so cosmic rays, 1912. Not some, a to scope on a near spacecraft yet, but that might be something interesting to do. <clears throat> this is the cloud chamber, and if you were at GPSL last year, you saw my cloud chamber that I got to work at home just fine and got to Pala, Iowa, and it did not work. <laughs> so I, I don't know what happened there, uh, but they are kind of fickle. The kind I was using uses dry ice. There's another type that actually uses a, uh, you change the pressure real quick. But this was discovered, developed, discovered back in 1896 by Charles Wilson. It's the Wilson Cloud Chamber. It uses supersaturated air, primarily um, alcohol, so like 91% um, um, isopropyl alcohol. <clears throat> Sits on a bed of dry ice, and that gets the vapors down to the point where the air becomes supersaturated with the alcohol vapor. The other way you can get to happen is actually decrease the pressure. So there is a, a type of cloud chamber that decreases the air pressure and momentarily gets that supersaturated uh, solution in the air. When ionizing radiation passes through those uh, through that air, it causes uh, condensation nuclei where the alcohol vapors will suddenly condense into little droplets. And you see the little you see these little cloudy streaks that, that exist only for a few moments, and the particles will drop off drop out until the next particle comes through, you get the, uh, the condensation nuclei forming again, a little cloud drops off again. Image on the right, you can see what it looks like, and that's a needle, and the end of that needle is a radioactive source, and you see the alpha particles are just streaming off of that. <clears throat> this is the one I'd really like to send to the near space, because I'd like to, to get this visual, this depiction of what it looks like. The first two types of detectors I've talked about, you really don't get any information about the type of particle. You just say, hey, there's radiation or there's not. Um, is, is it quantitatively, is it greater or lesser? The nice thing about a cloud chamber is you can put a powerful magnetic field on it and, you know, neodymium magnets will do it. Large particles in motion create magnetic fields, respond to magnetic fields. And you can actually see how the path will curve depending on the magnetic field that curvature tells you about the, uh, the particle, its charge, also its energy. The higher the energy, the less curved it is. If it's a positive or negatively charged particle, you'll get it to rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise. Also, how thick the line is tells you something about the type of particle also. Alpha particles tend to create a very thick line. Beta particles tend to create a very thin line. So you can actually get some idea of the type particle and its energy with a cloud chamber. And this is one of the reasons I would like to send one up into near space is to look at how the type of radiation changes, and, you know, whether I've got positive or negatively charged particle. Uh, the cloud chamber though, very famously was discovered a beta particle that actually had a positive charge. As you know, beta particles are electrons, they should have a negative charge. And that led to the discovery of antimatter. It had been hypothesized earlier it was actually the cloud chamber that dis was the first device to discover cosmic, uh, to discover antimatter. So kind of interesting, uh, you can do something like that with literally a petri dish and a slab of dry ice. Uh, the next one is the Geiger Muller tube. Now this is the one that um, a lot of you have flown before. So simple Geiger counters. The, uh, it was actually a part discovery. So Hans Geiger actually discovered it, but Walter uh, Muller actually made it a practical device. And these are famous for your 1950B black and white science fiction movies for the radioactive monsters and whatnot. This is the, the device you'll see. It consists of a tube that's got low pressure gas, one wire inside, and then the metal body on the outside. And these are charged, they have a, uh, they have a voltage applied against them. When ionizing radiation passes through, it creates a conductive path through the gas because it strips the electrons off the molecules. And that allows a current to flow between the wire and the outer body. It gives you a little bit of a current. 
then you can use a circuit to uh, you know produce a click every time that current flows through flows through the uh, flows through the Geiger Muller tube or the GM tube. Um, again, these are not really good for detecting the type of radiation, and in a way does because alphas don't want to penetrate the metal. If you have a mica window, alphas can get in. You don't really know, is it, high, is it a high energy cosmic ray or alpha particle or whatnot? You, you don't really know that kind of information. You, but you can get some idea if it's alphas or, or not alphas. Uh, the ones that I've launched are made by Aware Electronics. It's the RM60 and it runs off of five volts. It uses a, a voltage booster to bring it up to the geiger muller uh, tube, which is about 300 volts. The pulse that's created is only five volts, so it's TTL logic. And I can use a pickaxe and I can count the number of pulses uh, over a 10 second period. And that'll give me the amount of radiation. The geiger muller tube is good for determining radiation there, what level, not the type of radiation or, or its energy. Spark chambers, uh, the next one, and I've seen people uh, designing spark chambers on YouTube. Uh, you can actually try and make one of yourself. Uh, it, it's not really developed by one person. It was a, it was a development over decades, uh, popular from the 1930s to the 1960s. The picture on the right, you can see what, what a spark chamber. You've got a series of plates with high voltage against them, and literally they're like a stack of, of geiger muller tube. In this case here, when radiation passes through the plates, creates a conductive path and you see a spark fly between the two plates. If you look carefully at this image, you'll see these red dashes. Those dashes are the path that particle, subatomic particle, ionizing particle is taking through the spark chamber. Uh, in a way, this is digital. You, have, you either have the spark or you don't have the spark. You can see the path. Um, and see if there's, if put under a magnetic field, see if it's curved or not. Uh, you don't get high resolution on these because you have distant, you know, your distance between the wires can't be too great or else you end up creating a discharge as the air breaks down. The whole chamber uh, was the next one, 1952 by Don, Don, uh, Donald Glasser. Uh, this is a liquid version of the cloud chamber. It is, um, a chamber filled with usually liquid hydrogen. You can bring it quickly up to super saturation level, and then flash light, and then take a camera picture. And you get the paths, and you can see these paths they've got here in the right image here, on the, on the right side here. These are paths that particles create in the liquid hydrogen. And those are the actual condensation lines created by the subatomic particles. It's a dense liquid um, compared to air. And you end up with very thin lines, and it's a very brief picture. You have to take a picture. This is a, you, you don't watch these things. You need to get a picture of it real quick. You'll see the particles are spiraling either clockwise or counterclockwise. Those tell you that those are charged, and whether they're positive or negatively charged. You also notice that some of them are straight lines. It tells you that's an uncharged particle. But also you'll notice if you look kind of in the middle to the right, there's a V. That V is from a collision. A particle came in, smacked into a hydrogen atom, and split, and uh, you know, uh, created two new additional particles. There's a lot more information in a bubble chamber picture than there is with any of these other radiation detectors. They're not practical for you to build at home, and you certainly can't send one up in a balloon, unfortunately. Um, but these were, uh, you know, hooked up to the ends of particle, of particle accelerators, like at CERN or um, Argonne Lab or something like that. And they did discover some particles that were, that were hypothesized, that, that were supposed to be force carriers for the weak force, and they were discovered in the 70s, which led to the unification of electric and uh, weak forces together, so the, the bosons, the Z and W boson. Um, um, a great particle detector, but just not practical for us in uh, amateur near space. What's really kind of is, is going to really kind of change what how we're going to be able to detect radiation near space flights though are the solid state detectors. These are modern detectors. And they've, they've been going, you know, been building for several decades. But recently they've become um, possible for us to start using these solid state detectors, usually based on silicon or germanium. And they use PN junction. 
So if you have a piece of silicon and it's pure silicon, it's intri called intrinsic. There is no um, missing uh, places in that lattice where you have, well, let me rephrase that. In, in the lattice, it's perfectly matched up with a silicon atom in each, each point in that lattice, in that crystal structure. You can dope it adding an atom that either has uh, five electrons or only three electrons. Uh, so arsenic is an example, aluminum is an example. You can, you can actually replace some of the silicon with those atoms. And you end up with a spot or a, a, an atom in the structure that has either an extra electron or a missing electron. <clears throat> with an extra electron, it's an extra negative charge. They call that n-type material. And if, you are, if you only have three electrons, it's considered a uh, missing electron, so it would be positive or p-type material. Remember, the electron is negatively charged. And the image that you see here is an example of a solid state detector. Under the gold foil is a photodiode. And that photodiode is a is a basically a, a slab of, uh, of silicon with a, with a pin junction. It's covered in foil because you don't want light to reach it. Photons of light strike these pin junctions, they produce a current. Also, the Copper foil helps to shield it, so you have um, fewer problems with electromagnetic fields affecting the, the, uh, the detector. But this is an example of one of the detectors. You could send this up into near space, very lightweight. <clears throat> You're going to see in a, a later slide here, you get information from these that you don't get from the Geiger counters that, that we can send up now. The way these work is you end up with a piece of silicon that's intrinsic, you dope the side in, the other side P creates a diode because you have that PN junction. You can apply a voltage and you can sweep those, uh, uh, let me back up a little bit too. If you have an extra electron, it's a, you've got type material electron. If you're missing an electron, it's considered a hole. Uh, holes act a lot like electrons that are positively charged and they go the opposite direction of an electron. If you apply a voltage to a PN junction, you sweep out the electrons in the holes, the E's and the H's, and they sweep out of the region and you to create a depletion region. That depletion region has high resistance. Current doesn't want to flow ac across that. Um, the, the nice thing about these PN junctions, though, is that they have a band gap of 1.1 electron volts. So if you Give it a little bit of energy to get to 1.1 electron volts, you will create another hole in an electron. That's the same thing as having a gas ionize, where you know the gas molecule loses its electron. We now have an electron that we can use to, to measure, uh, you know, to detect that, um, that subatomic particle, but it takes 15 electron volts on average, give or take it's on the gas, to create an ionized atom. So at the PN junction, we can detect particles that create that um, have as little energy as 1.1 electron volts, whereas in a bigger molar tube, it takes a particle with 15 electron volts on average to create a signal. So 15 times the sensitivity, roughly 14 times the sensitivity with a solid state detector than you have with a gas detector like in the Geiger molar tube. So you're going to be able to detect uh, particles with lower energies with these um, solid state detectors than you can with a geiger muller tube that's gas inside. We'll see that there is a circuit on the bottom right that biases this uh, PN junction that will clean out the holes in electrons. And then above that is another circuit. This is a trans impedance amplifier. This makes uh, or converts a current into a voltage. Every time that a particle penetrates that PN junction, it creates the holes in electrons bias uh, current uh, bias charge will separate those charges you'll get a pulse a current that flows through the uh, the pin junction it's really difficult to measure the amount of current in a um in a, in a, in a, in a, in a device so you want to convert it to a voltage and then we can use an analog to digital converter to change that current into a voltage the ratio between the current and the voltage that's produced is uh Ohm's law and that is that feedback resistor RF is what controls that. So if you increase the value of RF, you get a higher voltage for the same current. So you can play around with that resistor to get a voltage that you can measure that's proportional to the current that's created. 
capacitor on top of that is there just to prevent feedback so that this thing doesn't oscillate and go crazy on you. And that you just play with that value there. Um, yeah, you can see it's an op amp. Uh, the PL, PLC272 is a good example of one that you can use. It's a fairly simple circuit, runs off of you know a five volt source. Um, so kind of principal options, which I guess I got a little ahead of myself here. Uh, so remember the charged particle, and normally in a Geiger molar tube, will ionize gas, but it takes 15 times the amount of energy to do that. Uh, when the charged particle passes through a PN junction that's been swept clear of its holes in electrons, so it's a depletion layer, um, it takes only 1.1 electron volts to create a, a whole electron pair. Here's the nice thing too, is that the more energy the electron, the subatomic particle has, the more whole electron pairs it produces. So you get more current. The more energy in the subatomic particle, the more current it's produced. Since you're going to a trans impedance amplifier, that means you get a higher voltage. You can now actually measure the energy of the subatomic particle by, by actually um, uh, digitizing the voltage to find what that voltage is. And that's something you cannot do with a Geiger Muller tube. Geiger Muller tubes, the, the Geiger counters, I only detect the presence of a particle, I don't detect its, its energy. You can do that with a solid state detector because of the nature of the pin junction and the way it works. Like I said, the trans impedance amplifier, the one I've used a lot is the PLC272, and I use that for a, a photometer, I use LEDs. An LED is a pin junction, but normally we give it a current to produce a voltage. It's the same thing as a solar cell. The LED is the same thing as a solar cell, except it's color specific. And in the case of a solar cell or LED, same thing with the, uh, the detect solid state detectors I'm talking about. A source of energy comes in, in this case light, and produces a, a, um, set, a pair, whole electron pair to produce a current, and we can then we can use that. The example that when I'm working with is a do-it-yourself example by CERN. CERN is the elect is the European uh, Nuclear Research uh, Center, and they are responsible for uh, big particle accelerators. The, the the Higgs boson was discovered at CERN. And they used two different types of photodiodes, the BPX61 or the BPW34. Um, they have to be covered to block light. They're shielded with metal to keep electromagnetic fields out of it. And the, and there's two versions you can get. You use the 61 to measure alpha particles. You have to remove the protective glass. If you remember your um, subatomic particles, alphas are usually blocked by sheets of paper. They're not, they're, they are not—they have a lot of energy, but they don't penetrate very well. But that's because of the mass, but also probably that's because they have a high charge. Um, so you remove the glass on the DPX61 to measure uh, alpha rays, alpha particles. For the second version of the CERN's do-it-yourself particle detector, you can use the PW34 and uh, it will detect betas or electrons. And you can use it as is. And that's the first one I'm building right now. I will later on build the alpha version. And they use a PLE2072 for their op amp. It's a dual JFET op amp. And that's going to be their trans impedance amplifier. And it runs off of 9 volts. So that's a piece of cake, 9 volts, uh, 9 volt battery. I can have a radiation detector uh, going up into near space. Here's a picture of the two of the sides of the board that I'm building right now. The top picture shows you the top of the, the printed circuit board, um, about three quarters of the way down with it right now. On the right side, you'll see the, uh, the dual JFET op amp I'm using. On the bottom is the underside of the board, and you'll see four black squares on the left. That's the photo, uh, the photo diode that they use in, in the uh, circuit. It's got four of them, so you have four times the area for detecting, current, uh, detecting radiation. So four of those photodiodes, and I don't need to strip anything off of them. This is just a extra, excuse me, an electron detector right now, a beta detector. I'll later on work on the, uh, the alpha version of it. That's the, the board so far, and what I need to do now is add the wires for power and for the signal out. So the whole thing will be encased in a uh, metal container 
Uh, some people have used the, uh, the aluminum mint cans. Um, the one I'll probably use will probably be an aluminum box that I can screw together. That box will, will keep it light tight, light doesn't interfere, and will provide shielding from electromagnetic, ra electromagnetic radiation. Now, here's the, the thing that, here's the, kind of like the, the, the money slide right here. This is the spectra you get from a solid state detector. Now, remember in the case of the AWARE RM60 Geiger counters, I use a pickaxe and all it does is count the number of pulses in 10 seconds. And I say, oh, in this 10 second range, I had 15 detections. At this 10 second detection period window, I had 50 detections. But with the, the CERN do-it-yourself radiation detector, you'll see you actually can measure the voltage they've scaled it to uh, millions of electron volts, but this is, it's really just a voltage. You just need to do the math to calculate it. So you can see you get a spectrum of radiation, the energy of the radiation. In this case here, they use an old orange glaze for uh, ceramics. And if, uh, if you've gone to old um, antique stores, uh, you can find some of the, the Fiesta ware. Some of that Fiesta ware, really bright orange, they used a, a uranium as a, uh, as a gaze, a glaze. There's two different isotopes of uranium that you can detect, and each of the isotopes produces an alpha particle of slightly different uh, energy. So uranium-238 has a slightly lower energy elect, um, uh, alpha particle, whereas uranium-234 has a slightly higher um, Alpha energy alpha particle, and you can detect, you can actually get that spectrum and detect those, detect those things. Now, I don't think I can do this with a pickaxe, so I better get back to learning how to use my um, Raspberry Pi again. So hooking this up to a Raspberry Pi, and collecting this data, and getting each of the voltages and saving it, um, and digitizing and saving that as data, and then figuring out what the scaling factor is going to be, I should be able to say at this altitude I got uh, this particle, this energy, and then you know, tenth of a second later I got this particle, this energy, and should be able to actually get a spectra and see how the energies change as the balloon goes up. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I'm excited about, and this is really the important thing with the silicon detectors, is nine volts, you actually get a s energy spectra from the radiation that you detect. And there's no practical way to do that uh, for a balloon flight, especially on the amateur level, uh, without being something like this. Uh, what the other alternative that might actually work is going to be a bit of a clue to get it to work out would be the cloud chamber. And um, maybe one of these days, but right now, this is going to be the way to do it, I think. Uh, if you're interested in these boards, and I've sent out three of them so far. Um, I spent five dollars buying the boards from PCB Way, and you know I said, "What? It's five dollars? Okay, I just need one." Well, no, you're gonna get five of them. Uh, so if you got friends or you want to make friends, send them uh, your extra boards. I kept two of them. And when you go to the website, this I went to GitHub to get this. They also had um, three, two or three links where I could go to uh, DigiKey and some other folks too, not just not, not just DigiKey. DigiKey had a list of all the parts. You clicked on it, it created the, uh, the bill of materials for you and you just paid and there was your, you had your order together, had all the parts you needed. So $5, multiple boards, click on the link, uh, pull up DigiKey's website and others, you know, Jameco for instance, and get a list of all the materials and hit the click that's ordered for you. And like four days later, bingo, I've got uh, my boards and I've got my parts. Um, so go to GitHub, and it's Ozel is, is the gentleman who is um, kind of managing the do-it-yourself particle detector on uh, GitHub. Also, this is part of CERN's Open Physics Lab, uh, Physics Open Lab, Open Physics Lab. I haven't checked to see what else is out there, uh, but if you go to their website, it looks like they have additional experiments and things that you can do. But this particle detector is one of them, uh, one of the projects that they've created. And for, you know, literally $21, it's a nine volt battery, you're ready to start detecting radiation and get the, sp the spectrum of it, what the energy levels are of that, of that, uh, that radiation. That's pretty amazing. Hey, Paul. So yes. you're getting close on time here. 
Um, okay. Also, I, you I had just, a question here. Uh, okay, I'm flown, done. I've flown solid state radiation sensor, the X100-7-SMD, a couple of times using Raspberry Pi to record the pulses. The main issue I found was the microphonic. Uh, it was microphonic, so I don't know if you know anything about that. No, I don't know that so sound. You got sound uh, or uh, audio frequencies coming through. Is that, what, is that what that's referring to? I'm not sure that was a question from Steve or okay. if you want to chime in. Yeah, so you have bring up more of that I can because I'm done with my slides here. Microphonic. So microphone sounds like it's um, Steve said yes, that was correct. Okay. Huh. Uh, so oh vibrate. Okay. Okay, so that's another issue. I hadn't thought about that. Um so if you if you um add the so one thing I guess is to add the board so you don't get movement relative to the board to the um, metal case, for instance. I might try something like that. Uh, but I haven't tried to actually digitize the data. I'm still working on getting this board together along with working this summer uh, for Franklin Building Supply and doing my gardening and whatnot. So I'll, I'll get to this. Um, okay. So I'll get that, uh, that work on. So, okay, so vibration was the problem. Okay. Um, so latex, so latex was just to keep it, I guess, from vibrating. I take it, Steve, is that, that what that's all about? I was thinking maybe foam rubber or something like that. Okay. Um, other than that, like I said, I can't tell you that I've used these yet, uh, but I'm really excited to be able to use this because I'm going to get data like I've never had before on a balloon flight. And other than that, if there's any other questions, please. Hey, Paul, you remember this? Which one is that? Yeah. Uh, Close that camera. Is that, it looks too close to the camera. Is that, is that a? Um, That's one of the buttons that you flew in 98. Oh, okay, 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 okay. You're too close to the screen. I can't get a good view on that. Okay. Um, so that was, oh, okay. Uh, uh, that was the uh, flight 90AE on October of 98. <laughs> okay. okay. I think that was, uh, I was tracking from here. You sent me the pin and that's what got me interested in GPSL. Okay, good job. <laughs> that's good, that's good to hear. All right, uh, thanks a lot, Paul. Well, and uh, um, uh, if you want to follow up with him, he's uh, um, uh, quite active on Twitter and uh, uh, 